for these lectures. And the question, of course, about how is it possible that you are your education? Of course, for you at 3B, let's ask this question. Who decides what ideas to share or to show? For you, who did that? Was it intentional or was it random, as we've uh, argued in earlier lectures on Plato's Republic? And to what degree are you, in fact, your education? Speaking of education, let's turn now to the second of the essays from this volume that we're working with in Volume 3, Milton's Essay on Education, as is often referred to. Let's talk about his own education. Some more biography for your notes. <clears throat> his father had enough money to hire Thomas Young, a, a, a scholar, a tutor, um, and a private tutor who was also a religious radical. There's, you can do your own research on this, but there's a lot of people who think that uh, Milton's exposure at a young age to Thomas Young, at age 10 Milton is exposed, already begins to kind of set the trajectory of his somewhat radical life. Um, he enters um, uh, St. Paul's in London where he studies his classics, especially Latin and Greek. In 1625, he, uh, at the age of 17, he begins um, Christ College in, in Cambridge. Um, and in 29, 1629, he graduates fourth out of uh, 24 honors grads. So um, we, we say it right away. It was obviously a prodigy at a very young age. In uh, 1632, he gains the Master of Arts so that he can become an Anglican priest. But he does seem to struggle to fit in. He's at times understood and labeled as an outsider. We'll, we'll see much of this in our study of his poetry in Volume 4. In 1632, and this is a huge year, so let's write that one down. In 1632, he begins six years of self-directed study with his father's library. <clears throat> now there's there's a lot to be said about this in his journals, sometimes called the commonplace book or it's kind of like a scrapbook, he writes a lot about this experience of these six years. Some have argued that this is maybe what led to his blindness later in his life. You'll want to remember that the reading that he's doing is by candlelight um, and so it's going to be a tremendous eye strain. Here's what I often have said, though, about Milton and what we seem to be able to deduce from a study of him in his biography. It appears that he not only read, well, how would you like this as young scholars, he not only read, but he seemed to be able to remember large amounts of what he read. His capacity for memorization was prodigious, and he could remember the things that he read. His study, then, is going to often give him the appellation of being one of the most learned individuals that ever wrote, certainly in the English language. <clears throat> his uh, ability to synthesize is prodigious. You'll remember that we define learning as the capacity to connect new information to old information. Milton is one of the classic examples of what it means to be able to do that. His language proficiency is remarkable. He uh, you know, is able to read and write in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, as well as French, Spanish, Italian. He learns Old English during some study, and finally, maybe even Dutch. For example, he uses the term landscape, which landscape was a Dutch term um, in Paradise Law. So it's, it, he's like, it's just almost like a sponge in those six years began that process. Then, in 1638, he does this amazing tour of France and Italy, and that is, that's gonna be really important there, um, sometimes called the Grand Tour. For example, he meets all kinds of famous people, like he meets Galileo. We'll, we'll have more to say about this in our study of Paradise Laws. In 1644, <clears throat> he becomes a private tutor himself, a schoolmaster. And it's there that he runs into, uh, at this time at least, uh, a, a, a man named uh, Samuel Hatler. And it's here that he will then turn to um, the publishing of, in 1644, a tractate or an essay on education for this individual, Samuel Hatler. He was a Puritan uh, educational reformer. Let's now turn to this treatise on education, and let's, uh, let's look at what Milton has to say about learning. Now, this will be a significant uh, moment in our studies, because much like our study of Ben Franklin's autobiography and some of the comments that we made then, it's hypercritical, I think, that we think about what it is that we're doing to improve ourselves and our learning. Obviously, um, we're wanting to become better students, better scholars, better learners. Let's listen to what he has to say. He says it this way, um, at the very beginning of this essay this, uh, of education, as it's sometimes referred to. The end, then, of learning is to repair the ruins of our first parents by regaining to know God aright, and out of that knowledge to love him, to imitate him, and to be like him, as we may, the nearest by possessing our souls of true virtue, which being united to the heavenly grace of faith, makes up 
the highest perfection. So let's just go ahead and say three things really quickly about his views on learning right away. <clears throat> first of all, he says, Adam, our first parents, and Eve, we'll hear more about this with Paradise Lost, they screwed things up, we have to a right. Two, he says, learning is about somehow learning to know God, so you can see the theological base ideas here. And then finally, three, virtue. <clears throat> In other words, your learning, he says, should be able to argue that we are making better citizens, better people. The moral component. Now, we should point out that uh, uh, Milton will make some distinctions uh, between different kinds of education. Watch this. He says, I call therefore a complete and generous education that which fits a man, and we should point out here it is men and not women, right, for Milton, to perform justly, skillfully, magnanimously all the offices, both public, oh, I'm sorry, both private and public of peace and war. And how all this may be done between 12 and 1 and 20, less time than is now bestowed in pure trifling at grammar and sophistry, is to be thus ordered. So let's go ahead and say a couple of things right away. Um, it's very significant that we're talking about a private individual and a public individual, right? To go back to an earlier, to go back to this earlier line the, that we were working with before, the idea is to repair, to fix, so that we can be both a good private person in our own privateness. Remember, Bacon called it in enough studies, privateness and retiring, in our own moral, ethical views, personally, but also in this regards to public, the sociological view, that citizens have to be made through their education. Now, Milton did share Plato's view in Republic, that you are your education. But unlike Plato, who is going to offer education in his ideal state to both males as well as females, Milton didn't have much energy or time for that in this essay. He really is talking about young boys, young men. Now, scholars who have studied this essay and studied Milton's biography have pointed out that there's this interesting kind of mix or blend between, on the one hand, a certain kind of Renaissance humanism that's really driven by empiricism and learning and hands-on learning and that kind of thing, and his own medieval education, which he himself obviously experienced, which is more religious, more spiritual, scholasticism, that's the study of Aristotle, and of course emphasizing morality. Um, we should point out that he says that there have been many mistakes in the making and learning generally so unpleasing and unsuccessful in this medieval approach. Um, and he will make the argument right away that learning should be fun. We think about Plato's Republic and the argument that he says in those early formative years that all learning should be fun, but then by Republic 7, in the cave allegory, you'll remember that he points out that learning is obviously about two elements, fear and pain. At the very beginning of this short essay, <clears throat> he begins by first of all pointing out that geography matters in terms of learning, that a spacious house, he says, a ground about it fit for an academy, big enough to lodge 150 persons. In other words, he's going to say, we've got to have a good building area. And then he says there's basically three parts that he wants to talk about in this essay. Their studies, their exercise, their diet. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's turn now to each of these, and uh, let's just kind of look at what is often referred to as Milton's proposed curriculum. All right. So we'll take a look at what he has to say. He begins with grammar instruction. He says seven to eight years is a waste of time for studying the Latin and the Greek. He says it could be learned in a year. <laughs> Let's just point out, he'll say this at the end of the essay, not everybody obviously is going to be able to conform to the kind of suggested curriculum that he's going to suggest, right? Um, he, he will make the observation uh, that, um, uh, but here he says the main skill and groundwork will be to temper them such lectures and explanations upon every opportunity as may lead to draw them in willingly obedience, inflamed with the study of learning and the admiration of virtue, stirred up with high hopes of living to be brave men and worthy patriots, dear to God and famous to all ages. This notion of being inflamed with the love and the passion of learning, Milton clearly had that. This has been one of the ongoing obvious debates, and I suppose you can write it down as a 3B question. For you, was school the place where you became more passionate about learning or less passionate about learning? Some students have reported, when I was young in, in, in elementary school, I kind of really loved to read. By the time I get to high school, I really don't like it anymore. Um, 
what, what has been the fault in the educational process. <clears throat> From here, he's going to go to uh, math, like Plato, he's going to put an emphasis on math. There will also be time for study of scripture in the evenings. The uh, experience of working men is also significant. He says it this way. He says, after the mathematics study, uh, he says, what hinders, but that they may procure uh, as often as shall be needful, the helpful experiences of, and now listen to this list. He says, I, uh, we want all these people around our students to teach them. Hunters, fowlers, fishermen, shepherds, gardeners, apothecaries, and other sciences, architects, engineers, mariners. Wow. The list goes on. In other words, let's put it in our notes. He does make the observation that the learning needs to be, and this is very much of that Renaissance humanist idea, learning needs to be hands-on. There needs to be experiential, right? Bacon would obviously have agreed as well, right? His experiences with working men immediately makes us think in the American tradition about what, about what um, uh, Walt Whitman had to say about I hear America singing and all of the different components of what that involves. Of course, he says that we're going to learn about the poets and especially he likes to say the rural part of Virgil. In other words, much like Thoreau, we think of Thoreau, that idea that, you know, you've got to learn how to plant your garden and, you know, and, and raise your bees and that kind of thing. He will make the observation that the required, he says, then will be, a requir will be required a special reinforcement of constant and sound indoctrinating, that's the word, to set them right and firm, instructing them more amply in the knowledge of virtue and the hatred of vice. And then he mentions Plato along with Cicero and Plutarch and a few others and, and, and lists that start to represent in some ways the list of some of the selections that Eliot made when he made the Harvard Classics list himself. This notion of indoctrinating should sound familiar for those of us who have studied our Plato's uh, Republic. Again, we made the observation in Republic that that kind of indoctrinating either happens through uh, some kind of intentional or random acts. Right? He goes on to talk about econ uh, the uh, study of economics and law. And then in an odd hour, he says, let's pick up a little bit of Italian. <laughs> he makes the observation that the Hebrew tongue should be studied as well. Um, um, and, and the idea that language and language learning is very, very important. Obviously, it was important in his own life. Um, he continues by saying that we'll need our students to learn how to write perspicaciously. And this notion of uh, perspicacity, um, insight, the ability to know how you think. You'll remember that Francis Bacon said in his essay of studies that writing makes us exact. The capacity to say, have you ever felt that? I know exactly what I want to say, I just can't, I just can't write it. Writing makes us be able to kind of formulate our ideas well. He makes the observation that poetry is going to be an important part. From hence, he says, and not till now, will be the right season of forming them to be able writers and composers in every excellent matter, when they shall be thus fraught with a universal insight into things. In other words, one of the most important things is this ability to finally be writers after you learn how to be thinkers an interesting idea. Um, he then moves on to the exercise, and this will sound very much like some of that stuff that we covered when we did Machiavelli's Prince, and the idea that there should be exercise that represents, gets us ready for war, fighting and defending our country, he thinks here of Sparta, but also peace, and he thinks of the Greeks and the Lyceum. He mentions both. There has to be a harmony or, or a coming together of both. Um, he says that Young students will have to learn how to use weapons and understand war tactics. And we immediately think, of course, in the Japanese tradition, as a uh, title we've shared before, Mushashi's Book of Five Rings, and within the Chinese war strategy, that uh, Sansu's art of war. The idea that students should learn how to defend their country through the study of tactics. We immediately think, of course, of our military academies, don't we? Finally, he says, diet should be plain healthful, moderate, uh, a Spartan diet would probably be the way that we would, we would think about it uh, as we say it. Finally, he makes the observation that only I believe, he says at the end here, <clears throat> only I believe that this form of curriculum is not a bow for every man to shoot in that counts himself a teacher, but will require sinews almost equal to those which Homer gave Ulysses. Yet, I am with all persuaded that it may prove much more easy in the essay than it now seems at distance 
and much more illustrious. In other words, it looks like a difficult form of study, but don't worry, you can do well and get through it. Now let's finish with some final thoughts at level three. Um, of course, we can ask, what are the great texts on education? We've mentioned Plato's Republic. We could also mention Plato's Mino. Um, think about Rousseau's Emile, that great classic French understanding of how an education can be su such a vital uh, liberation. We think about John Stuart Mill's own autobiography. I like to think about the autobiography of Bertrand Russell as well. You can come up with others as, as well, not just books, but think about movies. What's your favorite movie about education in schools? I always think about Dead Poets Society the um, recently passed Robin Williams and his classic rendering of that teacher who somehow understood that learning is more than just what we see in books. Right? Of course, we'll finish now with 3B. If you are your education, then obviously the question is, who are you? Think about this question. If you could change one thing about your education, what would it be and why? And why haven't you done it? if you could change one thing about your education. Is, is it beyond your control, maybe we might say? Your education is your education, but it begins with others who will first educate you, will select or deselect information for you. But by the time you're the age you are now, don't you think it's probably time for you to begin to address your own deficiencies? That's that thing in the neck we were talking about before, identifying your weaknesses and having the honesty the courage to be able to fix them after the honesty of admitting you've got those problems. The final text in the third volume we will turn to next, and this is Thomas Brown's uh, Religio Medici. It is an interesting title because it's a title of what we will call apologetics. We will spend a few moments talking about an apologetic and a non-apologetic approach to the study of religion and a theology. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed our opening comments on Milton. We'll come back to Milton. Thank you.